Hi, I'm Brian Utzi from the Kellogg Graduate School of Management at Northwestern University, where we hosted the second international conference on computational social science. This video highlights work from one of our keynote speakers, Matthew Selganik. Matthew is a sociologist at Princeton University and the author of the book, Bit by Bit, Social Research in the Digital Age. Matthew explains how the new world of digital experiments can make us all smarter and more capable of fulfilling our personal and societal needs. So what I'm gonna talk about today is running experiments. Why we like to do randomized controlled experiments, because they help us understand the effect of a certain treatment that's very hard if you just interact with the world without having a randomized control group. So in the past, this dimension didn't make sense because all experiments were analog experiments. And now more and more, uh, we can take advantage of digital infrastructure. So what are digital experiments? So I would say it's the, the, an experiment is more digital to the extent that you use digital infrastructure in the four main steps of experiments, in recruiting participants, randomization, delivering treatment, and measuring outcomes. So in the past, we've generally treated participants as sort of indistinguishable widgets, because usually we don't know a lot about them before the experiment begins. But in digital settings, we often have very extensive pretreatment information, and we also have very large experiments. And so these two things combine to make heterogeneity of treatment effects something that's much easier to study now than in the past. And it's an area where I think we'll see a lot of growth because it is both scientifically very important, like most of science you could say is about understanding when things will be bigger or smaller effects. And it's also very practically useful because you want to give treatments that will induce the effects that you want within the populations that you're working with. Okay, I want to do this. You've convinced me this is cool. Now, how do I actually do it? I don't work at Facebook. I don't work at Twitter. I can't really do any of this stuff. And that's not true. So I want to just talk about the different strategies that people can take and the trade-offs that are created by these different strategies. So I think the one that people think of the most if they're uh, outside of industry is partnering with, a, with an industrial partner. And so the cost of this is low to the researcher because the cost of the experiment is usually borne by the company. But it doesn't have to be a company. It could be a government or an NGO. So the cost is usually borne by the partner. You have medium kind of control. Like there are certain treatments that a company or a government will never let you run that you could potentially run <coughs> if you were fully in control of the system. The realism is often high and the ethics is potentially complex. So the other main approach is to just do it yourself. You do not at all need to partner with people to, to, to do these kinds of experiments. So one is you can do experiments on top of existing systems. This is like the experiment that I started with, Restivo and, and Vanderite. So the cost there is very low um, because the treatments are free to deliver. The outcomes are already being measured. Um, the control is generally low because you don't own the system. The realism can be high and the ethics can be complex when you're intervening in real social systems. Uh, you can build your own experiment, um, and I'll give you an example of that later. Here, the upfront costs are usually higher. It's more like a lab experiment where you, you have very high control and you can struggle with uh, realism. The ethics are relatively easy because you can control it. And the final thing, which I'm not going to talk about much because it's not very common yet, is you can build your own product. And then you can use that for repeated experimentation. So an example of this is MovieLens. So they've been running this project at the University of Minnesota for about 20 years, where they're providing people free non-commercial movie recommendations. And they have a community of, I think, hundreds of thousands of users over this period of time. And then this product provides a service to people and is then a platform for repeated experimentation. So this can be a very powerful combination. It generally is hard to get started, but I think as it gets easier and easier to build stuff, this is a strategy that researchers will be able to employ more in the future. OK, so this is sort of the menu of options that you have. And the most important thing to remember about this is you do not have to partner with anyone to do it. You can do it yourself. The last thing I want to talk about, which is ethics. Um, 
this is what I think is one of the biggest problems that we face as a community, the biggest challenge. We can look into the tradition of animal ethics, and there's a book uh, from 1959 by Russell and Burke called The Principles of Humane Experimental Technique. And this book had a big impact on uh, animal research ethics. And in this book, they proposed three R's of humane methods. So replace, refine, and reduce. And I would like to argue that we could use these same three R's with some slight modifications for how we think about human experiments. Um, so the first R uh, is replace experiments with less invasive methods. Next is refine, the second R. Refine treatments to make them less harmful. And the final R is reduce the number of participants. So we should not be, the argument here is we should not be exposing people to experiments unnecessarily. And I think these three things are going to appear more and more. A lot of the time, these treatments, it's very hard to know what kinds of effects that they'll have ahead of time. And when you're exposing large numbers of people to things where we don't quite understand what they're going to do, prudence suggests that we would try to keep it as small as possible. Um, so I guess one way to think about this, I think, comes from Spider-Man, um, the source of much wisdom. With great power, there must also come great responsibility. And so as a community, I see the kinds of things that we can do increasing really quickly. And I hope that we also, along with that comes an increasing sense of responsibility for what it is that we can do. So the three R's show that humane methods also can be an opportunity. So it's not just that a lot of times people think of ethics as something that's preventing research from happening. But I think that's not really the right way to think about it. These kinds of ethical concerns also create a lot of opportunities. So first, they potentially lead to more, they're more efficient than standard methods. So right, a scientific goal should be to make your estimates as precisely as possible. That's also an ethical goal. So those things are perfectly aligned. And then it also potentially stimulates a lot of interesting research. And here I think a great example is differential privacy. So for those of you who aren't familiar with this, roughly differential privacy is an um, exciting research area in computer science and statistics now. And the idea is that we can query databases to learn about aggregate patterns without learning information about any individual person. So it's a privacy pr protecting sort of learning technique. And it's been really exciting. And so there you have a method that's really motivated by partially ethical concerns, and that leads to a lot of exciting research.